and thank you so much for joining today's webinar. It's a really <clears throat> timely topic as we're at the end of the year uh, and a lot of organizations are doing their plans, putting their plans together for the next year and uh, figuring out how you're gonna communicate it to your teams. So we're here to share with you some tips. I'm Patty Sanchez and with me is my boss, Nancy Duarte. She's also my <laughs> friend and mentor. And uh, she's led Duarte for over 30 years. Uh, and so if you've been following Duarte, you probably know that. And today she's gonna to be sharing lessons from her personal experience and all those years of leading annual kickoffs that motivate employees. And uh, also, if you have been following Nancy for a bit, you probably know that she's written some books, uh, several best-selling books, in fact. And one of them we wrote together, which is called Illuminate. It's behind me. And uh, that book we co-authored together back in 2016 uh, to help leaders understand how to communicate to their employees as they're leading them uh, on a journey into the future and how to give them the emotional fuel that those employees need to stick with that journey through the good times, the bad times, the struggle, and the success. And so she's going to share those lessons today. And at the end, we'll take your questions. So just a little bit of housekeeping reminder that when we do the questions, we're going to pull them from the Q&A pane in the Zoom webinar toolbar. So look down in your toolbar, you'll see the Q&A icon, and that will be the place where you can put your questions. And I'll pull from those at the end of the webinar to answer them. And uh, I think with that, we should launch. So Nancy, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Take it away. Thanks, Patty. Amazing. I'm excited to be here today. And uh, people do ask me all the time, what presentations have you delivered that was the hardest? People want to know what was the talk that was toughest for the presentation lady? And the answer is always, always. It's when I present to my own team. So when I speak at my own company, when you speak at your own company, my employees are required to be there whether they want it, whether they want to be there or not. But uh, when I'm speaking to the public as a public speaker, they actually pay to hear what I say. And so they're there gobbling up all my insights. But when it's an internal talk, my employees who need to travel with me into the future, they know that what I'm about to say might require that they change in some way and it might require something from them. So um, what we do is almost every year since I've been in business, I have done a really big talk every January and it kicks off it either kicks off the very next year or it launches us into a longer <clears throat> three to five year cycle of change. And our vision talk is the biggest talk we prepare all, all year. And what we do is we, did, we kind of finalize the strategy in Q4 and then we work really heavily on the messaging, we work on the messaging for our talk itself in November and December to be ready for January. So I deliver our vision talk late in the week of Dr. MLK Day, which kind of feels appropriate to cast a dream that week in homage to him. And then we spend a lot of time on the talk because when you do it well, you get early traction on your initiatives. And if you really nail it, it's gonna give your teams this emotional fuel that they're gonna need so that they travel with you throughout the year. So when an organization has no vision, it can create frustration and hopelessness. And there's even an ancient sacred text that addresses it. <clears throat> it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, the word perish is a really strong word. <laughs> so maybe it, it could be disengage. It could be that they give up. Maybe those are more appropriate business uh, terms. But a great vision talk is going to move people out of one place and into someplace new. So keeping with this theme of sacred texts, I want to use Moses as an example because he had a vision. Moses wanted to travel out of slavery and into the promised land. So having a dream, it usually requires you to change today's circumstances so that you can receive the promise of a better future. <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> my, my coffee is stuck in my throat. Uh, but how, how is it that you're going to get those that need to travel with you? How are they going to know if tomorrow's promised reality, the promised land, is really better than today? So what Moses did is he enlisted scouts, and these scouts went out to verify if the future vision of this promised land really was good. So he sent out 12 scouts to look. They looked at the agricultural performance. They looked at the geographical features of the land and the population. And he said, hey, would you return back with samples of some of the local produce as evidence? So then the scouts came back, and they reported that it was like the land flowing with milk and honey. <clears throat> In fact, 
they brought back a cluster of grapes that was so huge. Two people had to carry a pole and then they draped the grapes across it. So it was beautiful, but they were giants in the land and they were like huge, like so huge. Most of the scouts were not confident that they would be able to overcome them. So as a leader, each time you declare this new dream, this new promised land, you probably see the opportunity, but the ones that you need to have come along with you, they're always going to see the obstacles, which is going to kind of amplify their fear of moving into this new and unknown future. So in fact, the case of Moses and the promised land, 10 out of the 12 scouts felt that the fight against the giants wasn't worth it. It did not outweigh the promise of the land. Now that's a lot of resistance towards a dream. So in business, you're probably really familiar with this S curve of innovation. It's kind of a business symbol that helps visualize the journey of leaving something old and entering into something new. So even though a leader might look at this like, oh, that's pretty clear, super straightforward path to this new destination, your employees know that it looks a lot more like this. It's more complicated. It's messy. It looks daunting to the ones that are going to make the journey. It's, it's more daunting to them than the ones that got to dream up the journey. So they can actually tell that when we ask them to move out of one place and into a new place that has all this promise of milk and honey, they're going to see the giants that need to be conquered. So Patty and I created what we call a VentureScape. It is designed to help leaders see what their employees see when we ask them to commit to the future. So the five steps are based in story, and it has a really clear beginning, a middle, and an end. But also we studied a lot of movements, several movements that had successfully moved people toward amazing outcomes by enlisting a vast amount of people to commit to help them. So each phase has its own set of opportunities and obstacles, which means your employees will have different emotional needs at each stage. For instance, in the dream phase, people need a moment of inspiration. In the leap phase, they need a moment of decision. In the fight phase, they're going to need like a moment of bravery. In the climb phase, they're going to need a moment. Or in the climb phase, a lot of times they need several moments <laughs> of endurance. And finally, when they arrive, they need a moment to reflect, to acknowledge either their defeat or their fantastic victory. So today we're going to zoom in and we're going to focus on the dream leap phase because how you describe what this journey is going to be like to them is going to determine how quickly teams commit and what level of commitment they're going to make to your initiative, your goal, your vision. <clears throat> I think my favorite thing about being a leader is that leaders get to make something out of nothing. We get a look into this dark, vast void of the future and dream about new possibilities that had never existed before. So something really lovely happens when we speak and we speak our dreams out loud. It's like it sets your dreams into motion. And sometimes when you declare your dream, your teams, they make the leap right away during the talk itself or immediately after, but some bigger, scarier journeys into the future. Sometimes it might take multiple talks to keep prodding people to jump in, jump in and commit. <clears throat> and it just isn't just a talk that you need to design. You need a moment of inspiration, and that's going to lead to the moment of decision. So the scale of fanfare around the dream is going to be driven by either how large or how small that the vision is, and how intimate or how public maybe that the crowd is. So I want to focus on some types of strategic moves that are driving your vision talk. So sometimes your strategy is to make offensive moves like grabbing the market share, taking advantage. But some years it's going to err more toward a defensive move and it's to protect your butt. So either way, the strategy usually has degrees of both. For example, we are going to launch a new business model at our company that opens up an opportunity for more people to become super great at communicating. It's probably an offensive strategy, but it's also going to distance ourselves from competitors who might not be able to make the scale of financial investments that we're able to make uh, during these really tough financial times. So I want to give you other, other examples outside of Duarte. So I'm going to give you an offensive and defensive vision talks that were done by Apple. So you might all be a little too young to remember that in the decade that Steve Jobs was away uh, after being fired, 
Apple had lost their innovative energy and they had tried and failed to create an operating system that had any of the modern features. And they were even eclipsed by Microsoft and they could not catch up and the world was worried. <laughs> so they had way, way too many varying types of products and their customers could not even tell which one to buy, what would meet their need and they were frustrated. So shortly after Steve uh, was back, he did a speech where he said they were gonna go back to the basics and he asked themselves, what do our customers want in our products? And they learned that consumers and professionals wanted two fundamental kinds of products and they wanted them in two formats, desktop and portable. And they had existing products that fit into three of those four boxes. And what that white box is, is where he built momentum all through his speech, built and built to reveal the new iMac, which got a standing ovation, which I, you could imagine always happens. I would classify this strategy as a defensive move though. Um, the vision wanted people to try to rally. I'm sorry. <laughs> I probably, I, my coffee's still stuck in my throat. So the vision, he wanted the people to rally behind that some of the products are actually, that these people love are actually not gonna be made anymore. And they were kind of contracting their product line to protect themselves because they needed focus. So contrast that to this offensive move he presented in 2001. So he announced the Apple's digital hub vision and things really took off for Apple when they focused on this entire ecosystem. Any company could have had this strategic vision. In fact, Bill Gates described this exact ecosystem in a keynote at CES one year earlier. And the difference is that Apple executed on it and the rest of the industry had to play catch up. This particular speech fascinates me. For the next 10 years after this speech, you could look at almost every product launch Apple made and it was foreshadowed in this one presentation. Many of our favorite products from Apple were a spoke in this hub. I would call this an offensive vision because it was the roadmap to disrupt multiple industries and they leapt way far um, above their competition. So let's position all the types of strategic moves in the context of a larger model. So I already established that a vision talk might have offensive and defensive moves in it. And then the strategies that kind of push your, push your organization forward, um, they're when you need to change your size, change your direction, change your position, or change yourselves. So let's look at the first column. Changing size may require you to expand or contract, and there's strategic reasons you do it. Changing direction may require you to reinvent or pivot. Changing market position, that may mean you stay in dominance or that you have to overthrow others. And changing yourself means that you're going to design how you metamorphose or you are involuntarily going to be forged into something new through the fire of crisis. So in 2008, my own vision talk totally backfired. <laughs> my president and I, we had lived through financial cycles of the valley and we had seen all the signs of a downturn coming. We felt that we were in utopia and that there was gonna be quickly, it was gonna go quickly to dystopian in the near future. So I desperately was like trying to warn the company that we needed to conserve, prepare, like an economic downturn was going to hit. And I was saying things like, you never know, in one weekend, we could lose a chunk of our business based on this impending economy. And I was trying to get them, we, we needed to pull back on spend. But then I was also like, now keep indulging all of our customers with these great experiences, all while the sky's falling, the sky's falling all around us. <laughs> I thought I was so freaking clever in that vision talk that I literally handed out umbrellas for a rainy day. And they were emblazed with this phrase, greatest show on earth. This is the actual logo. <laughs> and this was to be for them a symbol that even though tough times were ahead, they still need to do whatever it takes to give the clients a really great experience. Well, that talk came across to the employees like alarmism and fear mongering. I had not empathetically even thought or considered that most of my staff was in middle school when the dot-com crash happened. And they probably didn't understand the nature of an economy and that economy inhales and then it exhales. So after this fire and brimstone talk was done, one of my managers actually came up to me and was like, um, that talk, it's probably gonna take you like 18 months for you to recover your credibility. <laughs> 
Well, that was the bad news. My, got my talk got no traction or commitment from the employees. But the good news, it was probably only good news for me, was that the economy did actually crash nine months later. This was September 2008. And only then did the team wish that they'd not push back so hard on me. And I wish I had delivered it in a more empathetic way so they could see things like through my eyes. The other good news is that I was so convinced a downturn was coming and that this impending crash was coming. I wrote my first book, Slideology, and I refused to sign with any publisher who couldn't promise me it was going to be on the shelves by my son's birthday, September 3rd, 2008. It was like a fire in my belly. That book needed to be on sale early September. And wow, that was the exact month that the economy imploded and Duarte stayed flat the next year. But keep in mind, flat was the new grow back then. And many of my agency friends had to shut their doors. So I tell you, a vision talk is as much intuition as it is planning and maybe even, maybe even more so. So I was asking my team to conserve resources to protect us. But the problem was I was trying to protect them from a situation they'd never faced. I should have empathetically painted a way better picture of the enemy that only I could see, but I could have unpacked why I could see it and they couldn't. So for an effective vision talk to do well, there are two things necessary and that's to deliver it amazingly. And then once you've declared this new dream, you need to immerse your team in it so that they can envision and kind of embody and understand how their role is gonna make it reality. So I'm gonna share more examples of how you can learn from me and some of my mistakes. So here's another story for you. So I mentioned early the S curve of innovation. Well, our company is now in its eighth reinvention. And we started 35 years ago as freelancers and now we're leaders in the communication space, which is such an honor. So you can see the details of all these transformations in this amazing book. Patty helped write called Illuminate. Um, but most of these innovations were like exciting and forward facing and future shaping, except for this one. And this was probably the most difficult in my career. Um, we had to kind of intentionally flatten growth because we had kind of so much to fix. Um, and we, you can't grow and, and be uh, fixing yourself at the same time. So we were hitting up against what's called the Dunbar number. And um, that's research-based that states a community that reaches about 100 people. It starts to silo and break into smaller groups. If you, It only does that if you don't have formal systems in place. So in business, that 100-employee um, mark, uh, the experience starts to get unsustainable strain unless you start to put in professional systems that kind of unify the operating procedures, help get you over the hump. Well, to comp compound that, I needed to do initiative around process, but the word process to a creative soul, it feels like inviting the devil to dinner. It was <laughs> something. So we decided to give ourselves like three years to make this transition. And that's a long time to I know for a lot of you, it's a long time to implement all these new systems, process, change behavior. Sounds like we took the Band-Aid off really slow, like hair by hair. <laughs> but at the time, my organization wasn't accustomed to this kind of change at scale. So by January 2015, we'd already been at this for a year. And wow, people were tired. They were upset. The sheer amount of process and policies that we were constructing was starting to stifle everyone and it was becoming like counterproductive. So our 2015 vision meeting, the origin, it was the origin of what we call shop day. And it was inspired by Pixar's notes day. And we shut our doors for a full day just to work on ourselves. So we decided to listen to employees, uh, collect what seemed broken to them, and then commit to slaying those dragons. So employees were greeted at the door with a shop apron because we were going to work on the shop. I know, so cute. <laughs> we broke employees into small teams. We listened to what they felt worked, and then we let them tell us what was ugly about all the process that we were putting in. 
So we trained, we had to train our internal facilitators. They were our employees. We had to train them to collect the feedback and taught them just don't react, just don't react because we wanted to create space for the employees to feel safe telling us honestly and candidly everything that was broken about the shop. And the facilitators didn't flinch. It was amazing, but it was really hard to hear everything they collected, but we needed to hear it. So then we organized all their output into themes and visualized it. So whatever had bubbled up from employees, it was voted on uh, which one was a priority that they wanted execs to commit to and to support as part of the plans uh, for that next year. So the executives, we served everyone. We served the staff. We set up meeting rooms. We fed them. We kind of ran around, around with like little cart you know, cart helpers with snacks and and because uh, we wanted to serve them because the employees, they were doing really heavy lifting that day. So it was kind of intense at times. So we designed in the day playful little energetic interludes so folks could just keep going. And we had a massive rock, paper, scissors competition. And at the end of the day, eight teams delivered a two minute pitch for their idea to be chosen for the company to focus on. So the company voted for the top three ideas that they wanted to work on. It was amazing. Some teams were so impassioned about their ideas to drive and change the organization. They created these hysterical internal marketing campaigns to make sure their idea won. It was awesome. I mean, how many times do people, how many times do your employees create internal marketing campaigns like that to help create an amazing company? So it was amazing. At the end of the day, uh, we painted a communal art piece that we put up on the wall and we wanted them to feel like the sacrifice they needed to take, um, to make, to make this dream come true was gonna be worth the reward. So you'd think, wow, bam, nailed it, right? So uh, not really. I mean, we did. It was beautiful. We had, a, we had a lot of process to scale and to fix, and it was just too much for some of my team. So traditionally, people stayed decades at Duarte, and we had folks that just couldn't continue because that process was so bloated. It was like a straitjacket to my sweet creative team. So as the year progressed, I kept hearing things like, uh, could you remind me why we're doing this? Or I need you to provide a little bit more meaning to me, or I just am not going to keep going. So after I'd been on uh, the road as a public speaker for four years, I jumped back in as an operational leader to try to reinstill meaning into the company again. And I held a listening tour with customers and employees, but I felt compelled to go and really dig into our past and see if there's any stories there that I could take that I could attach meaning to and maybe ignite purpose again. So I really needed, this is probably my highest stakes internal talk. I really needed to nail my 2016 vision talk to motivate them because people were parched. And then I, I knew back in 2001, we had been through another really tough time and that was the dot-com crash. I really wanted to, um, we needed to become something new going forward. And I needed to recraft a really strong cultural foundation that was going to make us strong again. So I went to find my vision talk from 2001 during the dot-com crash to see what it was I, I communicated back during super tough times. And in this talk, I described what I thought that the spirit of Duarte was. What were our core values? And I felt really compelled to connect the team to who we used to be, to the meaning again. And this is a picture of those slides. And as I read it, words literally felt like they jumped off the page and like glowed. And they were create and, and cr to create great work and a great company, to belong, to find your tribe and be passionate about presentations, to serve, to serve the client and serve each other, especially our leaders are to serve. So I knew, I knew these values were still true. So I changed the word to create, to innovate, because innovation is what really drives creativity. And I added the word lead. And when I put it all together as a model, one of my writers, he noticed that it's actually an acronym for bliss, which is a really important word in my body of work. And I just gasped. I couldn't even believe it. So when I overlaid it with all the operating scorecard that we had used for years, decades actually, it all came together in a beautiful way. Um, for our vision talk during MLK week in 2016, I used this model and I knew I needed to give the presentation of my life. I desperately needed everyone to reconnect 
to the values the team needed to feel them so that they would have the energy to keep going. So we committed to making our process more agile, which means that we needed to actually dismantle many of the processes that we had just been putting in. So we worked so hard on that talk, like really hard. And when the talk was done, longtime employees said things like, that was what this place was like when I joined. It's what I always loved about it. And they wanted us to, they wanted to see us become this again. At the end of the talk, a lot of employees were moved to tears and it received a standing ovation, an internal talk. <laughs> Since I had dug all the way back in our archives to reconnect with our values, uh, the team thought it would be super fun for me to present in the old fashioned way. So we hooked up a 35 millimeter projection, projector and it goes, shk, shk, makes this crazy noise. It was so fun. Most of the employees had never seen one. So after each employee was given a little tiny 30, 35 millimeter slide as a little symbol of our new beginning. So throughout the week, we facilitated all kinds of different types of interactive exercises so the employees could immerse in this new dream. We made up a game we named Cards Against Insanity as we brainstormed all these new ways of removing the friction, reducing the strain. Again, now we're immersing them in the vision. To end the vision, we beat the heck out of these drums in a drum circle. It was like we were trying to beat the heck out of bloat. So uh, just as the drum circle ended, I'll never forget uh, the culture team that was driving the day. They asked my husband and myself to step into the center of the circle and hold hands. We had no idea what was about to happen and we were stunned. I just, I'll never forget. I'm kind of getting emotional. Um, I was just stunned as each employee held a copy of a blessing and they read it together and they blessed me and Mark. And to us, it was a sign that the employees were committed to leap into this vision. It was so beautiful. It was amazing. And that first shop day was designed by our amazing culture club. And they named themselves that. <laughs> I didn't name them that, but they're amazing. And this club emerged from within the company as an employee-led organization that wanted Duarte to morph into a fertile and fun environment again. And now they still continue to design all the immersive experiences at our kickoffs so the employees can connect to the vision. And then the employees also create bonds. So it's a team who cares that deeply. So how'd we do? <laughs> How did we do? We dismantled enough margin. We dismantled enough process that our margins went way up. But because I had been away, for four years doing all that public speaking, the problems were a bit deeper than I realized. So we had some really strong detractors and actually they had said, we don't even like the values you just put up there. We don't even align with them. And I'm like, what? But this instilling the values set a whole new base. It set a new baseline of clear values. And we realized that some of the people who got us this far we're not the right fit to get us to this next stage. So a culture can go into ruin really quickly without a vision or a visionary driving it. So I brought in an HR executive and I let her team do the hard, hard work of pruning, planting, investing, and nurturing to get the culture company thriving again. And it was fixed. And you know what that meant? That meant we were ready to grow. We were ready to take off. So 2020, we decided to have a strategy to expand, astronomically expand. <laughs> so January 2020, we gathered for shop day. And because we were setting a huge goal, we delivered a really inspirational vision talk. And then we had several sessions of content to make sure the vision was super clear. Then we immersed the team in the vision and the culture club built out these beautiful interactive sessions to get our heads and hearts around the content of the vision. And then they also had sessions that just bonded us with each other. It was just, it was gorgeous. So our goal that year was a big moonshot goal. We were determined to transform how millions of people communicate around the globe. And we were going to do that by consulting with companies and training learners as we help them grow their influence. But to do that was going to require that we hockey stick our growth like whoa, and then bam, 
later in the same month, COVID spread. And then our world turned upside down and our plans, they were thrown so far off course. <laughs> so within a couple of months, we went from a dream of expansion to a crisis where we were going to be transformed by fire. In a crisis, you either get burned or you get reshaped. So approaching a crisis, though, from an empathy first lens is going to be critical or people will not follow you through fire. So what do we do? We told stories. The Monday after shelter in place, the mandate, we told five stories from other crises that happened to us. Over 35 years, we've been through five crises. And the lessons that we learned, we told those stories that day. And it helped our team see that as leaders, we know how to lead through fire. And the company, it was their response was so beautiful. They just jumped in and they started to innovate our way through it. It was so beautiful. We dove in. We changed how our own workshops are delivered in person. We began recording new content in tiny bites, like bite-sized learning, so that we could adapt how the learners were now learning. They, they learn different in a remote environment. And then the agency created emotive customer moments, even while we were remote. Our internal meetings, our celebrations, they all changed entirely because we needed to create a sense of place and belonging and play. Our big tech customers, industry events, and even our own events, we needed to heavily utilize stories. We needed to be visually engaging and be memorable so we could keep the attention of these new virtual audiences. So you know what that means? That means our annual kickoff meeting, that needed to change too in this new virtual environment because how we deliver the vision talk and how we immerse the teams in it had to now officially change forever. So we still begin shop day with an inspirational vision talk in an effort to kind of cast the dream for the year. And even though we were in the COVID crisis, we still clung to the dream to reach our moonshot goal. And we even sent employees a NASA-esque inspired Duarte t-shirt. <laughs> Each morning starts by decompressing with one of our key leaders, Doug. He's amazing. He reviews the learnings of the previous day. He sets us up for what to expect for the current day. And then he has this smooth voice and charm and humor, confidence, and he sets the tone for each new day. And yeah, he even dresses up for it. It's so fun. So we ship unique boxes of snacks and they spark these great conversations as we enjoy kind of our dining experiences together. And then some of the sessions like this one about um, productivity hacks, it may fuel the vision because we need to be more agile, obviously, to get to the moon. But you can see at the bottom of the slide, employees are putting their little badges there to show that they're signed in. And then um, we design ways uh, for new and old employees to get to know each other. In the campfire setting, a facilitator asks a question like, who can speak multiple languages? And then employees move their little identity badge into the circle if the answer to the question is yes. And the facilitator would ask if anyone has a story to share about it. So we also invited each other into our homes. So if you sign up for a breakout, you were sent the supplies you needed to bake, or to create art or to make cocktails. And we also have all kinds of other learnings from our in-house experts. And closing each night uh, was storytelling with Becky where families would join around our little virtual campfire. It's amazing. So we always have a closing ceremony. And for this one, uh, we had the employees identify what strengths they thought they were gonna need to pull on from themselves um, to help us reach our goal. And they place those strengths underneath their uh, image on a board. Those are some of the examples of how we have cast our annual vision talk to explain um, how we're gonna help the employees commit to jumping in and helping. I wanna wait for the slides to catch up. Yes. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so these are examples of how we've cast our annual vision talk to explain where we're gonna go to help the um, employees see the dream and help them jump in. So years ago, I used to think that, oh, if I just do a super great kickoff in January, that'll be enough. The employees will remember it and they'll stay motivated all year, but that's just not true. <laughs> I had been, think about it, like I had been immersing myself in this content for a long time. I'm, 
thinking about it, strategizing about it, creating the strategies about it, and thinking about it for a long time before I'm presenting it to the employees. I spend months doing familiarizing with it. And so to expect the employees to just jump on board with one one hour talk, it just seems so foolish now. It's, it's dumb. So we have a great toolkit that's from Illuminate. It's available that'll help you communicate not only just the dream leap phases of the VentureScape, but also through the fight, uh, climb, and arrive phases too. So you can go to dorje.com slash Illuminate for that. And our Illuminate workshop helps you build a communication plan for the entire journey um, because the emotional fuel your employees need is going to change in each phase over time. So it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing toolkit. Please download that. There'll be a QR code at the end too. So I want to close um, with another bit of sacred text. And here's my final sacred text. It says, record the vision and inscribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run. And this was written over almost 3,000 years ago. And even leaders way back then knew the power of a strong vision, a great vision. It helps unshackle your followers from fear and uncertainty, and it replaces it with hope. And today we don't inscribe on stone. <laughs> now we inscribe the vision on tablets of the heart so your teams can run freely and make your dreams a reality. So there's a lot so much power in declaring a vision. My husband and I have done this now in our marriage for 42 years and for the company since 1988. So speaking out loud what you want to see happen seems to magically set things into motion and it helps your dreams come true. And I really hope that that's what happens for you and for your companies too. So thank you for coming today. Woo! Uh, so I'm going to applaud in the way that we do it, Dorote, uh, which is these jazz hands, uh, jazz hands. universal sign for applause, because I think it was amazing. And I, uh, judging by the chat and the questions, I think a lot of people feel the same way too. So we are going to yeah. take questions now. There are several. And just a reminder, if you do want to ask a question you haven't already, put it in the Q&A pane. Uh, you may have to expand your Zoom window to be able to see it, but we've got some already. Also, yeah. for those of you who don't want to ask a question, but you just want to get some answers, you can go to that resources URL or scan it with your phone and it'll take you to that Illuminate toolkit. So Nancy, lots of questions. Uh, and so I'll just take them in priority order. The first one is, and I think you have some experience with this. Uh, somebody wants to know, what if the team doesn't buy into the vision or is clearly against it? <laughs> You hire a great HR exec and do what I, I don't know. Um, you, um, it, it's like, it's hard. It's hard. You know, as, as the leader, you know, you know, and know that when something's the right thing to do. And uh, Patty and I had a, a little body of work that hit the cutting room floor. And we did this like degrees of dissent almost, right. Where they're just kind of like, Hmm, I'll, I'll know it when I see it, or I'll jump in when, you know, and, and it's kind of like that, but then there's ones that are like have their heels kicked in and they're like detractors and they're almost protesters and they're waving, waving it really well, waving, waving the, um, you know, they're entrenched. It's just terrible. So um, when you cascade a vision, um, you, you, and we're going to, it's interesting, we're actually um, codifying this in our own culture this year, you need to have the next layer of managers run with it too. So the execs can't just stand from an ivory tower and make this declaration and then, and then just be like, oh yeah, let's see if that happens. You got to get your leaders, the next level leaders on board. And we did this actually for a huge brand that shall remain nameless. Um, and what happened was they had had a strategy but the VPs, the very people who really needed to codify it into all the initiatives were not on board. And, and it, they did a survey and only like 24% even thought the vision was accurate. Well, how are you going to get traction there? We put them through the Illuminate workshop the, and, and they learned, they figured out how to message the strategy across different constituents through the whole layer of the um, VentureScape. And oh my God, it was amazing. Like it was absolutely amazing. So you, you have to change the hearts and minds. And then mm -hmm. at some point, 
if it's one of those life and death strategies, one of those that if they don't get this vision and, and, and you work your best on it, it may be one of those moments where the people that got you this far aren't the right ones, uh, that aren't the right fit to get you forward. I'll, I'll, sorry to take so long on this one answer, but I remember reading Onward by Howard Schultz and I was so moved because in it, he, he said, um, he only, only time he cried in his life when the people who got him this far weren't the ones to get him to the next moment. And he said, it's, it's the one time he actually wept as a CEO. And it, I brought, I had comfort in that because this was a, this was a tough moment for me. And um, yeah, it, it, it just depends. Like if it's, you know, entrenched detractors versus people who are like, mm, I'm going to wait and see, you know, it, it'll be easier to persuade some than others. Yeah, that's great. And I, I completely agree when you said we want to change the hearts and minds and, when that Illuminate workshop that Nancy talked about, we start by understanding the hearts and minds. That's yeah. that first step in the journey is to understand, to empathize with those audiences and, and try and get a sense for why they're resisting. Because there could be very reasonable uh, uh, causes for their doubt or their resistance, like Nancy yeah. said, and they're just unclear then that requires a different response than they're absolutely opposed and will never support the strategy. Uh, yeah. So really understanding where they're coming from is a good first step. Yeah, and Patty, we need to get that as a blog post out because it was a beautiful spectrum that she did about, it's really gorgeous. So cheer her on oh, in nice. the chat. <laughs> yeah, more to come, watch this space. Uh, there's another question sort of related, uh, which is how can leaders who are new to organizations leverage these principles? Is it easier or harder? And what's easier or harder? That is a great question. So um, I had a slide in here and I actually drove it to the little um, slide graveyard at the end. But, um, you know, there was the the S curves of innovation. And, and when you're when you're kind of at the top of one and you're starting a new one, um, that's, you know, it's just it comes in waves. Maybe it's a one year or, or three year initiative. But when a new leader drops in, especially if it's a CEO or especially if you're like running a bigger department, it, it establishes what we would call a new era. Like there's actually a moment where it's like, oh, this isn't about piling new like innovation curves. This is a, a hard stop. It could be a merger acquisition. It could be the entrance of a new leader. There are these bigger moments that are like more disruptive. You have to identify the values. You have to re-identify. You have to merge things together. You have to listen to the team, really. You have to do these listening tours. We do these listening tours like crazy. In the book, we feature uh, Lou Dersner. He, broke, he stepped into IBM when they were um, in a season of crisis, kind of the similar kind of crisis Apple was in. And um, he did what he called Project Bear Hug. And he went in and he literally, uh, the, the, um, uh, <laughs> the state, the shareholders were upset because he was taking a long time to drive change. But he, he took 18 months to actually decide what the strategy and vision was gonna be because he listened and bear hugged, flew all around the country and bear hugged customers. So I think it, it depends, uh, like all my answers are gonna be, it's gonna depend on empathy. Um, every leader needs to understand empathetically how everyone in that organization feels. And then you need to enter in a way that feels more like a, a kid glove, unless you were hired to be a revolutionary, which is a thing. Like you're coming in to stir up, because stir up people enough to um, actually create a revolution, which could be. So you got to understand why you were brought in, what the objectives are you're trying to accomplish. Listen, 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 listen like step into the shoes of the people that are there. I love using uh, Jake from Avatar as an example. Like he's this white Marine dude who thinks that the blue people are his enemy, the Navi, and then he becomes blue and he realizes, oh, they're amazing. They're beautiful. They have a tree of life in their world. And he decides, wow. Coming blue is amazing. So I guess my recommendation to you as you become a leader is become blue <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and live there for a while and then decide what you need to say. Yeah. Well, uh, there's another question in the chat uh, that I think a lot of people can relate to, which is when you say when you become a leader, and a lot of times people define leader as the person at the top, mm -hmm. but somebody asked, what advice do you have for middle managers, people who are in, uh, in you know, leading a small team in the midst of a larger organization, and maybe their role isn't necessarily mm -hmm. that clearly defined. So can you lead from the middle? Yeah, 
you're you're um the ones who are are visionary and can communicate visionary things are the ones who you could be a project manager and you might just be moving a project along that needs a visionary kickoff talk and 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 you inspire teams you get stuff done next thing you know you're getting you know 12 initiatives done and your peers are getting two who do you think is going to be picked for a promotion at that point in time so there's certain ways too um that that your vision has to be communicated up now. So you've switched it to from communicating out or communicating down. I hate to use hierarchical metaphors, but um, it's just easiest for me. Um, so you have to learn to communicate up. And there's a great little body of work in uh, data story where there um, it explains what executives care about. Um, executives care about what they're measured about. Um, and they're measured on three things, which is money, market, and exposure. So under money, an executive is uh, moving revenue up and moving profit down. Under market, they're moving, um, they're start trying to dominate the market and they're moving down the speed to market. And under exposure, they're trying to move up retention and they're trying to drive down risk. That's it. I really have spread that everywhere and no one's challenged it and no one's come up with any other things. So when you learn to communicate up, you need to make sure what you say appeals to the way the people above you are getting mess, um, are getting measured, and that's money, market, and exposure. If your content doesn't appeal to one of those things, you might not need to communicate up. You know, so I think it's just really understanding. Again, it goes back to empathy. Understanding who am I communicating to, whether it's up. What do they need? What do they measure by? How do they communicate? How do they need to receive information, and how do I deliver it to them in an amazing way? If you're communicating down to your own team, you could use all the principles in, in this um, webinar and, and any of our books are all about communicating to your peers and communicating to your industry, you know, communicating out to the broader world also. Mm, great. Well, there are some questions also about the nature of the message. So whether mm -hmm. you're communicating up or out, down, uh, a lot of people are in a tough situation right now where they're trying yeah. to communicate something, uh, a hard message, or they're trying to communicate in a time when they can actually see what's coming next, or there's not a lot of clarity. So what advice do you have for people communicating in that tough situation? You mean like communicating when it's just not clear? I'm, well, let's take a minute. Sorry, that was a complex question. The first one is communicating a difficult message. For yeah. instance, some organizations are having to lay people off, or yeah. uh, there are changes that are not going to be popular and well-received. Yeah, I've had to deliver unpopular messages <laughs> myself and and they take a lot of planning and they take running it by like taste testing it um, with others. Um, when it's difficult news, I think you have to um, increase the emotional appeal, not contrive it, uh, not look fake, not look like, oh, I'm, I'm so sad, I'm going to pretend I look sad. It's like, actually, if you spend time in their shoes being blue, you'll feel what it's going to feel like to them. You will have spent time thinking about, oh my God, this decision, it impacts their family. It, they won't make their car payment or they're going to, they might get, have so much stress about it, it can impact their health and they could get sick from this. Or, you know, you, you just have to think about what are they going to go through when they receive this news? Think about their brain cycles, think about their well-being, you know, all those things, and then, and then bake it into the talk that you understand that they're going through these things. So um, difficult talks are difficult and I think they take more time. And you also have to think through how they might resist, how they might react. And um, that's where a small tight um, brain trust would help you where you say, this is what I think I need to say. And I want you to tell me how you would visceral, viscerally react to this, how you would strategically react, how, what you might do, what happens if you, what would you look like when you're angry? How would you respond to this in all these different situations? And it helps you process um, how the audience is feeling. And when you know, when you know what your audience is feeling, you deliver it in a really um, empathetic way. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I want to just add that you didn't talk in this uh, presentation about how you communicated during COVID, but you did communicate in a different way mm, to our yeah. employees. And so you talk about delivering and immersing, and uh, you delivered differently without slides many times. You recorded video memos and sent yeah. them to employees. And maybe you could talk about why you used that format. Yeah, I felt like, you know, everyone's from their home, working from home. I needed to let them know I was in solidarity with them. I needed them to see my eye contact. I needed them to see 
you know, what made me laugh, what made me cry, what made me show up, how I, how I could show up. And I remember even like the day in California, there were so many fires, the day turned red. It was just so gloomy. I mean, it was just so um, crazy. And yeah, so I did video memos and I still do them. I think that'll be baked. This is one of the, one of the things that changed in how Duarte communicates that'll probably be carried forward in our long future is CEO memos. And some of them are written obviously still, and and some of them are um, spoken, but it was, um, I got a lot of, um, notes from people about how much comfort or how much bravery, or like I tried to tap into what was the fuel I was hearing people need. So what was interesting is some days I had very different emotional fuel. Like one day I was out on my veranda and I was like, okay, we're going to grow when we come out of this. I'm like drawing all these models kind of like fired up working on models. And then I came in and I had to have an internal like employee meeting. And I, I fortunately, thank God, I wrote a book called Illuminate that made me pause and think about, wait, I'm about to leave my own emotional energy and I'm going to go into a meeting where I can't, I can't be all like <laughs> jazz hands and excited. So I calmed, you know, I calmed myself down and I, I just changed my chemistry and showed up in a way where I was more in solidarity with everyone on the call. It's beautiful. Well, I know we only have a few minutes left, so we probably only have time for one more question. And I uh, answer them so long. <laughs> no, rich, richly. Yes. And richly and well. <laughs> uh, there's there's a lot of questions about or or just reactions to the conversation about culture and how you talked about the culture and how important that is, and uh, and people want to know, uh, you know, uh, how do you communicate uh, in a creative way in a culture where maybe there isn't a lot of permission to do that? So mm. I think this was an interesting question. You wow. know, sometimes companies put are a lot of restrictions and constraints on how you communicate. Is there a way that you can sort of communicate in a, uh, to stimulate that culture to create emotional uh, response even when you might be constrained? That's really interesting. So to thrive in an organization, you you need to kind of somewhat map to the culture like if you're in the military and you're writing a piece about you know the ukraine war you can't you have to work in the culture you're given right it's like it's 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 just different so there's a little i guess that's the framing for my answer is every culture even now like we have we have groups of people that make up our whole right and if you have control of your team your group um it would be a surprise to me that they're trying to trying to control how you manage your team um and that would be really sad to me but even at Duarte the the grander culture is well but there's little a little pocket here of a person who's unhappy and then they spread their you know it can spread but the greater culture is healthy um there are cultures that let a manager lead and and have the kind of healthy communication systems you might be craving but Businesses have constraint on their communications for a reason. If you produce something and it goes out on email and you're a publicly traded company, and then that gets forwarded out and it's in the press, like there's certain reasons. So remember I said a money market exposure, some of the, some of the constraints that a culture might put on how you communicate is to minimize exposure. Um, and so it just depends, like there's brand guidelines of how we talk in externally, how we talk internally and stuff like that. So those are the constraints of the system that you're communicating within. Um, if your hand gets smacked because you decide to host a Zoom call with, you know, and try to bond with your team for 30 minutes, I'd be concerned. I'd be concerned about that culture. Um, so you, you do have to still map into the system you're in, but um, everyone should be able to show it work genuinely themselves. And if you can't, that's that's a bit of a problem. <laughs> so, um yeah. Well said. Yeah, because your people need the emotional fuel, even if they're not people who directly exactly. report to you, but the people that you work with every day, your teammates, and uh, you've got to be able to create that space uh, to give them the meaning that they're craving and yourself as well. Yeah. Yeah. See why I wrote a book with that lady. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Nancy. This is amazing. And I know everybody was just really inspired and moved by everything oh, you shared today. So, nice. so just a reminder that we'll send out the recording in about a day or so. So you'll get to rewatch this, share it with your colleagues, share it with your leader, maybe. And uh, also you can be sure to check out that Illuminate toolkit. 
uh, on the Duarte.com resources site. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank we you. wish you all the best. Happy holidays. Jazz hands. <laughs> Take care. Happy, Happy New Year. Thank you.